go ahead and get going. Okay. Calling the uh, Compliance Enforcement Advisory Subcommittee to order today. Just, I'll go through roll and who's here. Um, looks like Ashley Reynolds is present. Uh, and we've got, uh, from the board, we've got uh, James Pepper and Kyle Harris. Kyle, any other board members? Nellie in present? No. Nope. In, in the with you? Just me today. Uh, Julie, okay. Julie's watching, actually. She just stepped out of her office. So. She is, uh, I'm sorry, who is that? Julie Holbert, board member. Okay. Julie Holbert will also be present. Um, from the NACB, we have Mark Gorman uh, and Gina Cranwinkle and myself and other um, other advisory subcommittee members from, uh, it looks like other subcommittees are joining us to help out as well. Chris Walsh, Savan Cotel, uh, and we also have Jim Flanagan and Skylar Janessa, I think is, uh, Another guest today. Yes, Scott. Skylar's from the Division of Affairs Department of Liquor and Lottery. From the Department of Liquor and Lottery. And I think that covers everyone. We have one member of the public joining us on this lovely rainy Monday in Montpelier. Oh, great. That should do it. All right. For attendance. All right, well, thank you, Tom, and thank you, everybody. Uh, this is the, I just want to remind folks this is the last scheduled meeting we have. And after this, we'll move more into an, an ad hoc basis. Um, I think the conversations over the last month and, and a half have been really great, really productive. Um, I think it was wise for us to return to retail um, inspection, security, enforcement. Um, today, Skyler with the Department of Liquor and Lottery is here. Uh, they've provided some insights to the board and to the subcommittee. And so I've asked Skyler to kind of give a rundown of, of their thoughts and, and how they typically um, you know, conduct their business and how they look to do so. Uh, adding this new uh, market, recognizing that, you know, uh, as, they, as they reference in their letter, everybody's got a lot to learn on how to do this the right way effectively and making sure we're, we're educating first and foremost. Um, after that, I think I'd just like to continue the conversation around transportation security. I think there was a lot of, um, a lot of thoughts, a lot of uh, perspectives that were shared at our last meeting, and I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to, after, after the weekend, to, to continue to share those thoughts. Um, I'm kind of trying to figure out uh, how to thread the needle on all these different perspectives and, and bring some of the conversation um, to the board level. So I just want to see if we can kind of find a way to to you know, do what we can to ensure that there is no diversion, that there's no theft, and that things are secure, while making sure that you know we're not overly burdening um, our small cultivators with certain requirements we may ask of them, retrofitting vehicles, so on and so forth. But uh, it's a tall task, but one that I think I'm starting to see a good starting point for um, as we talk about this tiered structure. Um, so with that introduction, um, Skylar, I can, I can turn it over to you. I'm hoping you can kind of give an overview and then we can, we can talk about how we perceive retail enforcement to really um, take shape here in, in the state of Vermont. Yeah, Kyle, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, members of the whole, bird members of the second day time and uh, the opportunity to as a can. Today, I apologize, I have my video off, but I am gonna screenshot bandwidth. I don't have the best internet where I'm currently. Uh, like Kyle said, I am here to agree and provide some perspectives that we were asked to maybe provide to the subcommittee in terms of retail security uh, parallels that we have uh, within the Department of Liquor and Law. And referencing a letter signed by our Deputy Commissioner. Uh, that being said, let me just quick overview of the document that we did just uh, first three things are a bit of a preference uh, or a split before the subcommittee is uh, first and foremost we acknowledge that cannabis is a completely different substance than beverage alcohol and tobacco uh, one that remains illegal at the federal level uh, and we know that that's going to have some unique challenges additionally uh, my office compliance and enforcement being the law enforcement uh, component of liquor and lottery 
did we're going to purport, you know, we're not going to purport to the subcommittee to be an expert uh, secure physical security uh, or sub. Uh, lastly, our current regulatory structure for licensed establishments really only can generate. All of those premises aside, what I would say uh, we are the best at at the Department of Liquor and Lottery is uh, triaging our regulatory structure based on a values approach. So as the board identifies and prioritizes its values, um, the regulation as promulgated by the board really reflect that to the subcommittee and the cannabis control board hey, uh, to, to have your regulatory. Hey, Skyler. Kyle, yes. Yeah, um, you're coming through a little choppy. I know. I know you're helping us out coming from overseas. How, would it make sense for me to try and screen share your document, and I can just kind of move us along, and that way we can save some of your bandwidth, so we can we can get the substance of what you're saying without it having a big chop to it. It definitely. All right. Give me one moment, and I will pull up your. Is my voice any better? Yeah. No, I think it's a lot better if you're not screen sharing. I, I think if we can just limit your bandwidth, that would be. Uh, or, or, you know, not overly burdensome your bandwidth, it might be more productive. So give me one second. Understood. And my incoming video, which may help also. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, yeah. The three preface topics there at the top. The next section uh, that the commissioner's letter addresses is conditions that the board has imposed that has uh, a nexus to site security. Or just to be very clear, none of them are going to directly be very and, and uh, prescriptive regulations around site security. All of them are tangential, and we, we put them. Them, uh, to, you know, to take into consideration there. What I want to say is uh, additionally, regulations down below are general regulations. As I've mentioned on a presentation before this board, uh, we strongly believe, even with uh, physical security, robust education report. Uh, because we've know we've learned time and time by science programs and really strong data that there is a lack of training and increased incidences of our license premise. So if you can each verse of these products uh, on the regulate they promulgate or laws uh, related to uh, it's going to be your uh, I'm getting really uh, numerous warnings can you hear me still Kyle you're definitely a little choppy I'm hoping we find our, our stride here um, so let's 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 keep moving along seeing if we can get you to find your stride with bandwidth if not we can we can open it up for discussion and maybe um, yeah. Rely less on you to, to speak, and, and you know I know folks with the subcommittee may have um, been able to work through all of this, but any you know I know we've got some some folks that have um, some alcohol background. I know Sivan and, and Chris do at least, and, and their experiences and how we how we might look to kind of adopt what you're doing with currently with with cannabis coming in but let's keep trying to move along Skylar and if it gets to the point where it's just futile um, we can pivot yeah please interject aside from yeah, yeah. probably useful information we sent uh, Kyle would have been the document experience retail operations uh, I'm hoping that maybe you can pull that up. If not, I can talk through it. Uh, that model is obviously very this model, meaning um, those are our 802 spirits liquor contractually entered with across the state. But in scope, then uh, our license 
restaurants, if you will, the board is much more so if the most uh, contracts are entered into, and work has established much more specific around uh, reading and prioritizing these responses to bids for, for the, sorry, these contract agency stores. What you'll find in here that each location is assessed using a yes. mobile app well house. We send multiple eyes to go uh, this assessment to limit bias and to uh, get the best picture of the establishment. We do receive on a uh, on a point based scale for a lottery board to again get a good understanding of the location that is applying for an 802 Spirits link for the board to uh, you know ability of this this location uh, to become establishment. I see this is very different. We treat our 802 agencies to treat bars and restaurants in the state. Uh, you know, one where control state which is housing this inventory is actually how so security is, is, is fairly important to the board. Or hey, it's taxpayer inventory that sits on these shelves. So secure security board uh, for these types of license. Since bars and restaurants, uh, that's so security is, is less factored in, certainly less requirements to hold uh, a, a first. Uh, so again, uh, that harkens uh, approach to you know rating criteria for suitability for these establishments. I'd love to demo and show you the application that we use basically at its max, uh, but the app we use is fairly configurable internally. Uh, so what we would say is, again, while my department isn't a physical city, we wouldn't purport to be, we are at uh, and, and do have the mechanism to do field level analysis of these locations. Location to collect the data that would be the most meaningful to, so, you know, level of uh, security in terms of physical law. Fox, the surveillance function for that surveillance video, things like uh, video in place, you know, all of those things that the board would have to then weight in terms of importance, we would have the ability to do uh, you know, site assessments and provide that in for ending license application to allow the, the board, who's ultimately going to be the licensing authority, into consideration when determining whether uh, a location is suitable or not. Really hoping I haven't lost you all connection-wise. I think it's at least a little bit intelligible. I'm happy. Uh, talk a little bit more about the regulations that are tangentially re related. Uh, I'm, ho I'm hoping I'm of assistance. Thank you, Skyler. Okay. I think I was able to catch maybe, I don't know, 60 to 70 percent of what you said, and that's no fault to you, but, but just, you know, the nature of, of how we're running Teams meetings these days, and, and you're in Europe. So I saw it was like nine something on your calendar. So, and I know Gina's in New Zealand. So, hey. We're on three continents trying to figure this out. Um, so I know I know um, I know Skyler's um, introduction was a little little choppy to no fault of his own. But but any opening thoughts on the documents that he sent um, for anybody? Anybody want to kick us off? I, I can give us some thoughts, Kyle. Thanks, Ivan. Um, and and it, it was helpful. Um, even though Skyler's audio was choppy, it was helpful. Um, I assume most of us probably read the document they sent beforehand, so you know, kind of could tell what he was referencing even when certain sentences were truncated. Um, I thought the, the the letter that that Wendy and Skyler sent beforehand um, was helpful in highlighting uh, the the balance, the, the balance that DLL has had to navigate, and the same balance that uh, CCB needs to navigate now of. You know what's the right level of high touch versus low touch 
right? You know, how, how in-depth are you trying to be? Um, and uh, the letter highlights a couple of things that DLL has done pretty well when it comes to certain things that, you know, establishes that the licensee needs to do X, Y, or Z, but doesn't necessarily specify how they have to do it. And leaves that at the discretion, you know, like the, the intentionally vague paragraph in there that was highlighted in the letter about you have to control your establishment and control the conduct of, you know, patrons at your establishment. It doesn't say what that means, but it puts the onus on you to make sure that your place is not unruly and that you don't have people getting into fistfights, right? And, and so I, I think that that highlights well some of the things that um, it's helpful to make them explicit, but also helpful to put the onus on the licensee to figure out what that means for them in their business. Um, so I, I thought that was a, a, a nice highlight in there um, that, that probably does transcend the barrier between alcohol and cannabis, even though they're very different products. Thanks, Vaughn. Dave, I know you work in enforcement. I'm gonna pick on you for a second. Any thoughts? I can't really guarantee that my internet's any better than Skylar's, <laughs> just an FYI. Um, the mustache is. Uh, Skylar has a good mustache too. You guys are rocking it. So. Uh, the only one in this, no one in this house likes it. <laughs> um, I have a, a, a question about the uh, uh, failure rate for uh, training, which was at the very bottom uh, of that letter. Uh, I like DLL's educational approach, educate for regularly, that's uh, very much a standard across state agencies. Uh, but how did you, uh, how do you come up with uh, the folks to train? Are these mandatory classes? Uh, how do you keep it interesting? Uh, and do you provide extra education for those who have a higher failure rate uh, with enforcement. So I guess my question, after all that, uh, potentially could be, do you continue to educate those who perpetually fail? And at what level do you do enforcement? Yeah, uh, great questions. Uh, so first, I would say uh, the answer is, uh, we do have mandatory, servers of beverage alcohol they have to they have to renew that certification so uh, there is uh, our laws they change almost every legislative systems change at regular intervals um, once as the industry grows as the retail marketplace legislative uh, to that and I would assume that would be the same so having that continual uh, you know refresher training at set intervals I think it's really going into uh, to follow up training yes this monitors our compliance rates very closely people acknowledge our website displays licensees to checks uh, and follow up uh, education that uh, additionally uh, typically when our board will mandate retraining for sellers and servers as a, uh, I wouldn't want to call it a punitive measure but as a as a measure to adjure uh, issues that we see uh, by the business to a mechanism that the board has levied uh, in turn so then for in the Thanks, Skylar. Dave, did you get what you needed out of that? I don't know what I have to do to potentially do that. I don't know. If that was a question to me, I didn't quite, I didn't quite uh, catch that. Dave, you might want to type it into the comments. While we're fighting some tech glitches on a Monday, anybody else have any thoughts? Ingrid, based on your background, do you have any, uh, any thoughts on retail security enforcement inspection? Uh, not at this time, sorry. I'm 
struggling to to follow some of the the comments and such here. I can appreciate that. It's uh, one of the pitfalls of, of teams is you're relying on the internet. So, Ashley, so I'll I'll circle around to you. Any thoughts? I'm just curious, I mean, this is just a proposal, but are we thinking there's going to be some sort of hybridized enforcement of DLL and ad, or are we kind of still trying to figure out if that even makes sense to have both overseeing? I think right now the board hasn't made any final decisions. I think we're still looking for, now that our market analysis has been turned over or recommendations have been turned over to the legislature and it's seeing where we are from a proposal perspective from ag and from dll this kind of starts painting a picture on dll how dll is thinking about it from my perspective you know and in our proposal to the legislature we do signal that we are hoping to bring some enforcement staff in-house but we don't have there's a long way to go before the legislature I think would include that in our budget for the next couple of years. So, you know, right now this is where, where we're at and just trying to, to come up with a correct combination that gives consumers, cultivators, retailers, and general public enough confidence that we have good partnerships with sister agencies to, to get the job done. I, I would imagine that retail right now, we're, we're kind of thinking about this in this context of, of retail enforcement. I think there, there could very well still be some consideration from the Agency of Agriculture there and also from a, a, a product safety perspective, you know, on the store shelf and, and shelf life security and along those lines. But, um, you know, I think what I am hoping for out of this conversation is to think, you know, given these documents, you know, where we think DLL might be a strength to the board um, and where Ag continues to be and will be a strength to the board when it comes to a retail end of things. So hopefully that's some good table setting. Um, but I, I can appreciate how there's still some uncertainty on how we're trying to, to fit the puzzle together. And I like the idea of perhaps, you know, I, I'm thinking about sort of how this is going to roll out and so much is going to be based around quality assurance, making sure that we know where things are grown, how, you know, and so forth. And then I, I could see a really nice hybridized training happening for these potentially new enforcement officers. It seems like DLL definitely has the experience. Um, I'm just hoping we can see some kind of adaptation to helping act specifically with that. Um, Tom, I see you. I think she was passing the baton over to you, Tom. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, actually. I, I, I just had other comments. You, you can go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I just, I, I'm really liking this idea of collaborating. I, I just don't know necessarily if, what that really entails. Um, I need to look through that document a little bit more as well. I mean, safety at retail level is going to be huge. Um, I'm just not sure who is going to be best equipped for that. But my, my comments were just on on Skylar's documents. Uh, also, the 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 letter figuring the point system, uh, which was very helpful, Skylar. Uh, and I appreciate you sending that around. Uh, I was surprised by some of the level of detail uh, because it didn't, didn't include things like lighting. And so, what we were proposing, Skylar, um, or, or at least regulations that other states have are other factors like video surveillance and alarm systems that I think you could adapt easily um, into your point system. And maybe you could you could just type a comment or, or send something later about what your thoughts were on including some of those other measures into the point system and maybe having some of those mandatory within the point system. Yeah. Not constantly. I know my voice is choppy. I'm going to pull, uh, so maybe most of it can come through. I think all we would simply need, and the other states uh, have instituted by way email to us, I think we could take a look at a bit into that point system paradigm 
the question is of most important value in terms of and as suited by directive or decision. Thanks, Skylar. I think I caught a lot of that. I, I totally agree with Tom. You know, we've been talking about tiering this for certain businesses. I think this point system of, of trying to reach a certain goal with your, your points to be able to be considered in compliance and successful as a retail storefront kind of follows a similar path to how we're talking about security and other portions of what we're trying to do here. So. I really appreciate the detail there as well. Um, Savannah, I see your hand up. Yeah, uh, since we're talking about the, the point scoring system, I just want to highlight the difference between alcohol and cannabis. Um, DLL uses that system for evaluating the agency stores, i.e. the stores that we all see we drive around and say Vermont liquor store, right? Because those stores are run by private uh, businesses, but those businesses do it as agents of the state. And so the state uses that system to require they meet a certain standard. They don't use that system uh, when it comes to evaluating all the other licensees, i.e. manufacturers and uh, you know uh, things, things like that. Um, but that being said, there's no reason that we can't be thinking about a system like that. So you know, the, the, they don't use that system when they go do their inspection. They go do the inspection of a place and they say, are you meeting all the code requirements? Right. Right? Not necessarily a point system, but the point system helps them evaluate the agency stores and whether or not they want to keep um, renewing those licenses or pick someone else as a replacement agent, um, et cetera, since those stores are acting on behalf of the state. But I do like the conversation we're having here that basically says, we could be using this in any way. We could be using a point system to think about how we evaluate when we go do an inspection of a manufacturer, or we do an inspection of a retailer, or, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fine framework to be thinking about. Um, so it's just a food, food, food for thought for us as we think about what our options are. Yeah, my, my understanding of the documents is that that's, that's the score for the application. Um, I think that's how it's titled. So, yeah, I mean, yes, but, but specifically, it's only the application for people who are going to be liquor stores on behalf of the state. Good. They don't do that for any of the other stuff. But again, we can't right. can do, you know. Thanks, Yvonne. I, I agree. Chris, I know you're with us. I know you haven't been able to participate in a lot of these meetings. I also know you have some some experience in, in this kind of regulated world, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to express any thoughts or opinions. Yeah, I'm looking at this Regulation 17 um, regarding not uh, serving alcoholic beverages to anybody displaying signs of intoxication. Um, I, I'm kind of scratching my head how that's going to translate to cannabis. I mean, you know, clearly if somebody's tremendously medicated and, you know, isn't making sense, I understand, you know, not ser serving that person. But, you know, a lot of cannabis people, even ones in the adult rec market that are still sort of using this medicinally are using it all day, every day. So. What does that mean for cannabis, that regulation? I mean, you like if someone is clearly under the influence of THC, a dispensary can't sell them cannabis? I'm not, I'm not sure how I'm reading that. So if I'm shaking his head, maybe you can give him some clarity. Well, I, I guess it's just uh, taking with a grain of salt what things translate from one to the yeah. other. You know, the, the, the DLL rule is about serving. Um, so, you know, as someone in a bar who's had one too many and that's essentially requiring the bartender cut them off, um, that's very different from someone who walks into a store and buys a six pack or in, in our case, you know, uh, walks into a dispensary and, and purchases cannabis. It's about impairment, right? It's, it's not, I mean, again, it, it's a vague statute and, and, you know, DLL tries to give guidance when they teach people how to, how to interpret it, right? Obviously, people who are drinking are getting somewhat you know, influenced by that behavior, but there's a there's a border of you know what is too much, and sometimes it's a bit more of an art than a science. But you know, with with cannabis, I think as with anything else, if a person walks into your store and they're not making sense, you might not want to serve them because you can't tell what the deal is. But that's not exactly what we're talking about with someone who uh, you know is using cannabis both medicinally, or recreationally, and you know uh, some level of, of background normality is different from someone who uh, who you know doesn't 
doesn't make any sense, right? So I'm not sure that one perfectly translates to cannabis, especially since we're talking about retail. We're not talking about uh, you know licensing you know smoke rooms where you can go hang out and consume. Um, I mean, maybe that's what the board is thinking about down the line, or, or that's obviously a much different uh, scenario. Yeah, actually, uh, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I mean, it, it, to me, it gets it's going to get tricky when you would have potentially a opportunity to purchase and consume on the same property. No, and I, I appreciate that you raising that point, Chris, and Savan, you helping to translate. I mean, Skyler, Skyler's here. I know that he's choppy, um, but this is also feedback for Skyler as they look to try and figure out how to translate this. So pointing out those kind of gray areas where we need to not, you know, to, to adjust things accordingly to how it's going to be benefit all interested parties separate from the alcohol industry is, is something that I, I know DLL is looking for feedback on. So thank you. Tom. Yeah, just following up on it, um, what Chris was asking, what I think Siobhan an answered was that that's, it, it seems to me that's speaking more towards uh, over serving in a bar, which is to, and um, I mean, Jim Pepper and, and Kyle probably know more about this uh, than I do, but in Arizona, it's called dram shop liability with, with the bars. That if you say you serve someone and there could be, you know, a, a lot of liability going forward if there's an accident and injuries and, and death. Um, that area of the law in cannabis and this is this is nationwide. I mean, some are calling it gram shop liability, right? Uh, and how that's going to work going forward, and it's not very clear. Uh, but and because in Arizona you, you don't have statutes on over serving, but I think Siobhan's right. It's really up to the licensee holder or, or the business. It's in their vested interest not to over serve, um, and because that liability can come back to you eventually and you know going to insurance seminars on this that liability can you, you know how far back does that go right um and the issue is does it go back to the, the prescribing doctor does it go back to the i mean it, it, it can flow a long way but it all starts at that that point of sale um and the, the retail owner shop owner should be aware of that um there's not necessarily regulations nationwide on that. There's just a rule of thumb, you know, don't don't overserve, um, and that's going to be present, should be present in the in the industry in, in Vermont, regardless if there's regulation that comes out on it or not. Yeah, Tom, uh, I just want to chime in. Uh, dram shop laws are all that does exist in the state to the liability in Vermont. Not only can you sue anyone who's dependent uh, individually or separately. So I would concur also. Regulation 17 being certainly used in the context of over purpose establishments, not necessarily a direct translation to the retail schema that we're probably talking about. Thanks, Skyler. And, uh, and just so everybody knows, the on-site consumption lounges will be explored in our exploratory committee. I'm not sure if anybody on this call is, is participating in that in that committee specifically, but it is something the board will consider kind of like in phase two of, of this marketplace. And if when we get there, depending on the relationship we have with state agency partners, I would imagine that you know, we can explore certain parts of their of their regulatory interpretation um, that might be beneficial for what we're trying to do here. Jen, I haven't um, heard from you yet. I know you haven't had a whole lot of time with these documents. And I know Massachusetts did things a little bit more in-house um, than working with other state agencies, but you know, any, any first impressions on how this either looks similar or different than what you've seen in practice and on paper um, in Massachusetts? Well, I, th I think it goes back to the premise of what's your values, right? And so that is the basis of what any regulation is going to be that you put forth. Um, <clears throat> we've talked a lot, not only in this committee, but in the marketing subcommittee that I was part of, of, of tier levels and, you know, and scaling things up or down based upon how big the business is. And so if that's the value system that Vermont wants to go with, then certainly you can you can act in a manner and create regulations in a manner that 
is approved like that. Um, it's true, the Cannabis Commission in Massachusetts, we did everything in house. I mean, um, I think one of the things we didn't do in the beginning was we had to contract with a hearings officer so that someone could appeal a decision that the Cannabis Commission made. Um, but everything was done in house. This was our own entity. Just as with alcohol, it's housed in our Alcohol Beverage Control Commission in Massachusetts as well. So everything alcohol is, is in that subset. Um, I really do think that when it comes to <clears throat> security, uh, you know, you really want to secure the product. You want to secure the person. You want to, everyone wants to make sure that this isn't diverted to children, um, that the product is locked up, you know, at night when people go home. Uh, those are the basics, and how a state gets to that is their own is their own way. I think um, one of the difficulties has been in you know, not so much for Vermont, is that those of us that had legalized early, we didn't have a playbook. We didn't have anything to go on. And so we had to create it as we did. Um, the statute in Massachusetts is a little different. We're not required to partner with other agencies, but in our work, we took, so for instance, our packaging and labeling, we took statements that the Department of Public Health makes on certain products and put them on this product as well. We took pieces from other agencies um, and sort of made it work with the Cannabis Commission. Um, we knew that law enforcement has an enforcement piece of this, and so they have the ability to, to go into a cannabis business if they, they feel something's wrong, things like that. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't overly you know obnoxious about it. So I mean I think you're on the right track. The question is going to be and what I've always said is, what does the big picture look like? Because all these subcommittees are looking at very, very specific issues. How is the board going to merge that work between the subcommittees? Um, and so, you know, compliance and enforcement is dealing with the issues you're talking about today. Well, the marketing subcommittee is dealing with tiers and licensure. How does your enforcement factor into renewals when it comes down to renewals? Things like that. Um, but I think the input has been uh, broad enough that the board should be able to come up with systems that work for Vermont. I mean, short of things like not leaving the state lines when you're tra transporting, I mean, those are those are federal laws. Those are things you just can't get around. Well, thanks, Jen. And I think if I think about the work of, of every subcommittee, but, but this one specifically, I think and I know we haven't taken a general consensus or vote on every single thing that we've done, but I think one of the things that we can uh, arrive at a consensus on right now is that this does need to have a certain tiering system within it for security. We've, I've heard this in outdoor security, maybe less so in indoor cultivation security, but in the retail context and the transportation context that the board needs to really look at its regulations on par with, with how we're tiering out the market structure. Um, so I think if there's general takeaways on what I can take back to my board members and as we start to develop an application and, and regulations, I think what I'm hearing is it really needs to be dependent on the size as to which you're cultivating. And, and that honestly creates a lot more work for, for the board. Um, and I'm, I'm willing 100% to wander down that road and do that work if that's the direction that we all think that this market should, how this market should look and feel trying to right size as Jen said, the, the stuff from every other jurisdiction that we've seen and explored and then kind of putting the Vermont feel on it. So those are my, that's my general takeaway from the last month and a half. But, I, I'm, I'm, but, you're, but you'll also have, you'll also have the ability to have internal processes, right? So right. Your, your regulations allow you to do the overall rules. And then the enforcement piece of that, whether it's, you know, a, an application process or an enforcement process or compliance or whatever, you can have those internal processes that over time, if they're not working, you have the ability to adjust. I mean, one of the biggest mis misperceptions people have is that once the regs are in place, the regs are like legit in place in set in stone. In Massachusetts, we did two subsequent reg changes because some things weren't working and because our statute is broad enough that it allowed us to pivot when we had to and adjust our rules to that. Vermont will have the same thing. Once you set the rules in place, your process, your internal process, will be able to play out um, in, in licensing and enforcement and you know 
some of the other regulations that you're going to have. Um, I can imagine that one of the things that's going to have to adjust is, is energy efficiency. If the legislature passes any energy bills because a lot of people are doing climate change, that's going to affect the cannabis business as well. And so things like that are just going to have to evolve over the next five to 10 years. Absolutely, and that specifically is something I've been working with the sustainability committee on. So I think we're we're on a we're on a good track there. Skylar, I see your hands up. Yeah, I just want to jump on on the Jen's comments and Jen's comments would just be that I I, I agree with it. It's important to mention uh, that with an evolving regulatory landscape comes that much more. So I just consider that as the rules change and grow as they important that you can uh, push out that and pay your retailers so that they can understand it. And then, and Kyle, uh, it, the more prescriptive, the more important we believe uh, a, a strong uh, regulatory inspection model is that, that go unchecked or uninformed or are really, they're not really worth the, the paper that they're written must echo both a really strong education regulatory inspection model. Thanks, Skylar. Pretty sure I caught that. Sivan? Yeah, like Skylar, I also just want to totally agree with Jen's comment that I would essentially summarize as uh, this is a living document, right? Um, regs change and laws change. And Skylar actually mentioned that earlier, and he kind of brought it up again just now, but he mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, part of the need for education comes from the fact that the alcohol laws change every year. That's actually true. And DLL's regs don't necessarily change every year, but pretty much every year, there's some alcohol on the bus bill in the legislature that passes a couple changes. And it may be changes that were, you know, requested by industry and DLL and the legislature thought they were fair, or maybe the opposite direction. Maybe some of the legislators wanted or DLL wanted, but. You know, every year there's some amount of probably five or ten things that change in alcohol law and that ends up giving rise to yes that, that need for constant education um, so yeah to Jen's point things change CCB can rewrite the regs at any point if they want to obviously you don't want to do it all the time you know but if things aren't working yeah you can change them and certain things will be big enough that CCB doesn't have power on its own to change them they need to go to the legislature but I'm sure that will happen. And the same way that DLL brings suggested changes to the legislature every year, CCB might do the same things, whether it's every year or not. Um, one other thought that I just wanted to share while we're still on this topic is something else that I think DLL has done very well, um, which is an, an informal, uh, it's, it's not a rule at all, honestly, um, but it's essentially an informal rule that DLL always teaches licensees in the, uh, in the education seminars. Um, which is uh, for years, DLL has basically given licensees permission to make up rules if it helps you deal with an unruly customer, right? That if you're in a bar and you cut someone off and they're like, no, give me another drink, that you're able to make up a rule that is plausible so that you can blame it on the state, not yourself, to externalize it. It's just a way of dealing with someone who's unruly. Right? You're able to say, oh, I'm sorry, like, I saw you nod your head like you were falling asleep. I, I know you're fine, but the rules are if I see that, I can't serve you again. I could lose my license. I'm sorry. You know? um, and that's just a, something to highlight for, for CCB to think about as well. It's, it's really more about culture than anything else. Um, but I always thought that was a helpful touch that, that really speaks to, look, the regulations might be complicated. They might be difficult to comply with sometimes, but that you still know that the regulator has your back. And they're trying to find a way that enables success. Thanks, Yvonne. And I, I agree with everything that's been mentioned. I think we're already trying to, to think through how to provide the most flexibility within how we attempt to do things, to, recognizing that we're not going to hit the nail completely on the head first try. I think few have <laughs> in this, uh, and Jen already attested to that in, in trying to enter this marketplace. So we're, um, well, we're going we're gonna to do what we can, and, and I, I like the tiering uh, kind of system that we've all been contemplating and, and trying to understand how to not be overly burdensome to the extent that we're able on our on our smaller participants in this market and allow them to uh, achieve a certain standard but doing so in a way that's financially feasible for them and, and you know doing so from a point system or a combination of different security measures you know so on and so forth and, and this is this has been great 
Um, Skylar, thank you so much. I think I think this helped inform Skylar's thoughts on how to approach this moving forward as well. And we'll continue to have conversations with DLL. Um, um, I, I want to quickly try and pivot back to the transportation tiering system. I, I don't know if anybody had any final thoughts. We were very fastly running out of time last Thursday, and I rushed to get a waste conversation in that. Uh, we had been pr predominantly talking about the sustainability waste context. Jen signaled that that was the appropriate place to talk about most of it, and I'm appreciative of that, but I wanted to give anybody any final thoughts on, uh, on, on the internal transportation of, of cannabis between different stages in its, in its life before it hits the retail shop um, to share them, and then I want to move on to public comment and, and adjourn the meeting. Ashley, any final thoughts? You're the first top left on my screen, so. I think you went on off mute, then on back on you. Um, and, and no, no additional comments. But um, I, I do see it as a risk. I do, I do. But um, I just wanted to reiterate last week, where you know, talking about the plants being different, hemp and THC specifically, they don't look any different. And so whether we're transporting hemp or we're transporting cannabis, THC, high content THC, the plants look the same. So I regretted not mentioning that last week and wanted to make sure that we state that. Thanks. Thanks, Ashley. And I know, I know, I know Gina's here. Um, I know, Gina, you had mentioned that this might be something that you would consider talking with the Social Equity Committee about. And I don't know. I know we're all crazy busy. It's so hard to pack content into these hour-long meetings, but I don't know if that's a conversation that's been had in that, that committee or if there's a plan to before we kind of do this initial phase one wrap-up. Yes, yeah, so we spoke to the subcommittee on Thursday and that they said they would be happy for social equity delivery licensees um, to deliver for other sectors of the industry um, with cultivations if they weren't able to do it on their own. So, so essentially they would get first first shot, first crack at, at that kind of ancillary part of this industry if, if that specific company or organization can't deliver the product themselves b between um, parts of the supply chain. I just want to make sure I understand correctly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to belabor it too much if you've already Got got smart inquiring minds thinking about it in that committee. I don't want to. I think it's a. I think it's a good idea. Um, interesting idea. And interested to learn more on on how the committee feels about that. Um, any any final thoughts before I turn it uh, over to public comment? Actually, we don't even have anybody public in the room, so we can just keep going. <laughs> Our one uh, member of the public has left left the room. So, any final thoughts on on transportation and where we should start as a even as a baseline for small cultivators, I guess from my perspective, what would really be helpful is if I could hear, if, if there's one, I, I'm thinking maybe like a lock, a lock box of sorts, I'm using a general terminology, if there's one baseline security measure that our small cultivators can do that's not overly burdensome where they need to retrofit their truck with expensive equipment, so on and so forth, what's the one baseline security measure that we should include for for anybody no matter the size of their of their um of their business anybody have any thoughts ingrid well i think you said it i think locking locking it down comes to mind but i i'm curious what ashley and other folks think i appreciate that ingrid um I mean, locking the vehicle, I think, is enough. Locking the product physically down inside the vehicle. One thing that's been a huge issue for us is like compliant um, containers that don't leach um, harmful chemicals or other different who knows what <laughs> um, from coming from these plastics. Um, there's been a lot of issues out west where the flower is grown organically, it's tested organically, and then it's tested again before it's consumed. And that's where we're seeing hits for these different contaminants. Um, we've come a long way. There's definitely new packaging coming out every 
day, but with these supply chain issues that we're already seeing, um, with products that are plastic products, it doesn't have to be plastic product. I know that's one of the easiest, um, but there's already such a shortage. There's already such a difficulty in getting these things that, um, again, I just, I don't want Vermonters to be out of luck because we can't get compliant packaging or compliant um, contain locked products physically inside the vehicle. Um, I think a lot of us are most concerned about keeping it the right temperature, uh, making sure it's not, a sub, but sub, um, that it's not subject to heat for some long periods of time. So making sure the vehicle has some kind of air conditioning or some sort of refrigeration to transport. Um, but no, I mean, <laughs> locked down is tricky. And like, what does that really do? Like, okay, you break the windows and then there's another level of security that, that doesn't allow you to get the product. I mean, sounds like what we're talking about for transportation, like they're not even gonna be able to leave the vehicle or there's gonna be someone else in the car that's inside the vehicle. So it just, it seems a little bit redundant. Um, so that's kind of my comment there. Thanks, Ashley. Any other final thoughts? I'll, I'll just agree with Ashley and, and, you know, after a couple of days since the last meeting, I, I, I still kind of come out um, where I think I was last time, which was that I think that locked in the car and can't be seen from outside is sufficient. Um, I don't think we need two drivers. I don't think we need, you know, I mean, I, I think it's totally reasonable to say you can't leave your vehicle. I, I, I don't know if we need that, but that's at least a reasonable one to say, right? Like, you know, uh, you, you don't go make the delivery and leave the car unattended you know, the, the store comes out to you, you know, at the loading dock or, or whatever it is, right? You, you don't um, leave the car parked at Walmart and go run your errands, you know, on your way. Okay, I think that's fair. Um, but again, if it's locked in the vehicle and not visible from outside, I'm not sure how much any of those things are necessary. So I really don't think that we need things beyond that. I still think that building an internal lock container inside your locked car is overkill. Um, you know, I still think that multiple drivers is overkill. Um, and actually, I think unhealthy for, for small businesses. Um, but I also still stand by it might be fair to require higher uh, levels of rules for uh, either larger shipment or for third party folks, i.e., distributors. And like, if this is going to be built into the truck from Rhino Foods or you know, Rhino Marks Foods or whatever, that maybe they have different kinds of rules than you know, a cultivator who's delivering himself. Um, and or if it is a delivery from a massive 25,000 square foot indoor grow room, then maybe that's different rules from, you know, a small, less than one acre uh, outdoor grow. So I, I, I think the tiered approach that you mentioned, Kyle, does make sense. Um, but I also still think that at, at its most threshold level that locked in the car and can't be seen from the outside is already more than enough, I think, you know. And, and to Ashley's point from earlier, they're already doing it with hemp. And that looks like a campus, and we haven't heard stories of rasps of break-ins and thefts in cars when someone thinks they see a large amount of cannabis in someone's car. You know, so you know we already have, we do have a body of knowledge and experience on which to draw. Thanks, Yvonne. Tom and Ingrid. Yeah. Th thanks. Just to respond to, to those two comments, and then I mean, my main comment is. Uh, I think it's still important to have the manifest and to extend the, the tracking, the seed to sale tracking and tracing system throughout the vehicle. Uh, I, I think that's that's mandatory in, in, in every other state. Um, I, I'm not advocating for, for two drivers, although I, I certainly see why it makes sense in a lot of states and add security. Uh, but as far as, as locking it and securing it, I mean, I, I think what happens typically in other states with, with the theft is that when the driver, the, this is more for delivery, but um, even if it's just from transportation to the retail place, if you're doing multiple ones, like which is what happens in a lot of larger cities, uh, that, that's where the danger is, is when the vehicle's left unattended when the delivery's happening, that's when the, the car becomes the target. And again, we're, it's, uh, I know the hemp program's been in place, uh, but, but this is this is really a different animal when, when you're talking about cannabis, and I think it's going to be more sought after. I don't know many people that are on the hunt to steal someone's hemp versus 
Um, because of, of that point, three or you know one percent threshold that you have, um, but I think it becomes a lot more desirable just as a even cash value well, when you're talking about cannabis. And yeah, if you know, if, if again, I don't have a criminal mind, but if you know, it makes sense to me to, to target cannabis more than it would hemp, um, and not go after the big truck that that you know, is advertising that it's in there. But if you know when some regular deliveries are, uh, that's what I would go after. Um, just like I wouldn't go after if I'm gonna steal something, the big farm by the side of the road, I'm gonna find the one that's, you know, off in the dark somewhere that's not fenced. That's the target. Um, so the, the, those are those are my only comments. Thanks, Tom. Ingrid, round this out. Um, more of a comment. I just wonder, and maybe this is a bad comparison, but I think there's statute already around how medical marijuana can be transported, and I know it's different means. I just wonder if I think that there's a locked container mandate for uh, medical marijuana. So I just I'm just noting that if we're not requiring any sort of block. And I hear what everyone's saying about it. I certainly um, think those are good points. I just wonder about that disparity. Yeah, without being without being intimately familiar with, with the medical program and how you transport that product with, within the supply chain, but also there, there is delivery from medical dispensaries to patients. Um, I mean, they do require a lock box, but, but if, I agree if it should look similar depending on, and, and that's not to say we would adopt the medical, the current mega medical regulation, but just to bring consistency throughout both sides of the market um, when we do make some decisions around delivery. Yeah. And, and Ingrid, I've, Go ahead. Got the med so I've got the medical subcommittee in an hour, so I'll, I'll confirm that and I'll, I'll let everyone know. Dave? Uh, thanks, Kyle. I, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, Tom, uh, but hemp has not been stolen from people's cars. Uh, we have no record of that. Um, I'm unsure, you know, I mean, knowing that the plants, you know, with just with the differences in THC, but they look exactly the same, I'm unsure as to how a rash of break-ins is going to occur with a bunch of people thinking that they're stealing one plant when in reality it could be another plant. Um, I just haven't heard of this happening. Have you heard of this happening in other states? Sure. Um, you know, where people are looking for cannabis and they're actually getting hemp plants because they've broken into a car? No, I, no, I, I, I'm not surprised that there aren't a rash or reported hemp thefts. I, I'm just now to the extent that um, someone might know not know the difference between hemp um, and and cannabis. Um, I, I I don't know. This is more in the context, David and uh, Siobhan, of uh, delivery for for cannabis, um, which you don't really find with with hemp. So there isn't there isn't kind of the the confusion that oh. I might be knocking off a, a hemp delivery instead of a cannabis one. I, I mean, they know they know that it's they know that it's cannabis. Um, so that the, the situation you're describing or what you're asking me to report on is, yeah, maybe someone mistakes hemp for for cannabis. I'm not aware of that either. It's usually in the delivery context where it is going to be cannabis. Does that make sense? Hey, I mean, it it does. I, I understand what you're saying. It's just that. You know, working in the hemp field as far as regulating it, it's not uncommon to see a pickup truck with a load of plants in the back of it driving from farm field to farm field. Nobody bats an eye. Uh, nobody is going, everybody here already has like a gun in their car uh, for one thing, but for, for another thing, uh, I just haven't heard of anyone doing that. Uh, it, and I don't have a criminal mind either. Uh, I certainly am not advocating for anybody. Yeah, it seems like Ashley does. I, I wouldn't think that, um, but I, I just haven't heard of anybody 
doing this. So I, I just want to make sure that this is a real example that you're talking about, and it's not something that has has not happened. Or you know, maybe Jen, can you weigh in with hemp and people breaking into vehicles during transport, thinking that it's a cannabis plant, or other way around? I mean, I don't think there's a lot of reports that are saying that that, that happens everywhere, but I think not to be the cynic in the room, but as the regulator, you have to think about both sides. You're, you're protecting the plant and the personnel. So you're protecting the employee and the plant, right? And that's why whoever your, your driver is going to be is going to have a plan in place that if something does happen, this is what they're going to do. I think on some level, the public's watching. They know it's not legal yet. They know it's going to be legal soon. They know when Vermont is going to do their, you know, their first delivery um, or what have you. And so you have to just be thoughtful or mindful of that, is that you're going to have this um, on the road. You're going to have trucks that are driving down the street. I mean, some people go to the extent as to have dummy trucks. Like there's multiple trucks that look the same. So the public doesn't know where the plant is. And I think on some level, it, it's not to try to have a criminal mind, although sometimes I, I try to think what they're thinking at the time, being a, a psych major. Um, but what could happen, to, you go back to those values. You protect the plant and the personnel. And at that point in time, what do you do about that? One, you have some sort of level of security. Two, you may have you know no signage on the car. Um, it's not as simple as throwing a bunch of plants in the back of your car and thinking that they know it's coming from a farm and nobody has any questions about it. Because uh, at the end of the day, this plant is worth more than hell. <laughs> this plant is worth a lot more. People are paying a lot of money given, I mean, and I mean tax-wise and all that. People are paying a lot of money to purchase this product and no amount of taxes seems to stop people from that. Even though there's a lot of complaints that there's high taxes, it's not preventing people from buying it. So it's more than just hemp versus cannabis. It's go back to the value system and do you protect the plant and the employee? Yes, David, just to follow up, I, I don't, I, I'm shocked that there's any hemp theft whatsoever or that you'd have any record of it just given the nature of the plant. But clearly you did in early September uh, when they knocked off that that other farm, like 50 stocks and however 200 pounds of whatever. Um, I mean that that did happen in, in Vermont, um, and there weren't any safety regulations or anything in place. And to me, that's even more attenuated than you know the transportation of, of hemp that's already been harvested. Um, so it, it it does exist even for theft of a hemp crop that was planted. So I can imagine more people are going to, there's going to be more demand uh, on the criminal side for something that's already, you know, sitting there waiting for you in a vehicle. I'd be curious if there's an insurance um, required, if the insurance companies requires a level of security for the car or the vehicle, whichever. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Tom. Ingrid, is your hand new or, or, okay. Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, I appreciated what Jen just added to the conversation. Um, but I also wanted to ask, and maybe this is such a little thing, but assuming that we have people transporting large amounts of, of cannabis, um, are we going to let, like have like the manifest include some sort of official documentation? So if there was like a car crash or, you know, a car stopped for speeding and then the car is loaded up with, you know, how do we differentiate between the folks in the car driving um, large amounts of cannabis from people doing it for Ill, ill-gotten, you know, for bad reasons versus the market here, right? It's a little thing, but I'm just wondering what is, what are we thinking about that? I'm not sure who that's a specific question for, or just a general comment. But I think that there would there would be yeah. you know ways if if there is as Tom said, the manifest might be important to include the seed to sale tracking component of that to make sure that 
folks that are still working in the illicit world, transporting it, trying to pass it off as a legal product, you know, so they don't have a complete, you know, defense if they are stopped to say, hey, I'm working legally. There needs to be some way to trace it back to, you know, it was grown by a license holder, transported by a license holder, so on and so forth. So I can appreciate that comment. Savan? Just to put a nail in the coffin on, on the, the hemp discussion earlier, I just want to clarify. I think that what I was saying, I think that what David and Ashley were saying was that we don't see this type of behavior in hemp overall and that uh, a, someone who does have that criminal mind that all of us are professing not to have, for the record, I don't have one either, um, that someone who does have that criminal mind doesn't know that that is hemp. That was the point. The point is that there have been lots of uh, opportunities to tempt people to think they're stealing a lot of cannabis when they weren't, and we haven't seen a rash of that behavior. So just just, just put a final point on that that commentary. Thanks, Simon. Ingrid, is your, is your hand up again? <laughs> I got to get used to people lowering their hands and raising it and keeping track of that. So some people forget about the hand, and others are really good at it. So my apologies, Ingrid, if you have another. Another new comment. Nope. Kyle, I have to make a motion to adjourn. I gotta go into my next committee meeting here. Um, so you guys can continue, but I'm gonna scoot out. Yeah, I mean, we're 10 minutes over time. This conversation's been great. I think, thank you everybody for your work. I think I'll be in touch, the board will be in touch to the full subcommittee, or for, to the full advisory committee and to this subcommittee. I hear what everybody's saying. I think this tiering structure being individualistic with how we, we approach certain tiers of our market is, is a focus that this subcommittee wants the board to bring to security, generally speaking, and we'll do our best to, to do that, and we'll give an update to folks um, when, we, when we have something to update them on. So I appreciate everybody's time, and, and yeah, we can adjourn the meeting. And, and Kyle, this is our last meeting un until further uh, ad hocs, right? Correct. So now I'm thank gonna go work with- It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna go work with our general counsel to, to turn all of this conversation into something practical and tangible, so. Thanks, thanks everybody. Appreciate it.